Macken was always a sinister character ever before we heard that he took a down payment of €100,000 to kill the monk and he was going to get 10 times that. No, is that right? What's a million? Well, yeah, nine times. Yeah, 10 times. 10 times. 10 times 100,000 100, is a million. Okay, if he had of managed. going to get nine to times this put down. Yeah, I was going to say, anyway. <laughs> right, well, we have the sum. Yeah. But look, when the feud broke out initially and... Yeah. Johnny Kyo and other members of what's now called the New INLA were being hired by the Kinnahans in order to carry out those sort of earlier hits. And they were caught fairly quickly because they were within the neighbourhood. They didn't really cover their tracks. I think they were just so anxious to make the money. But Macken was actually in jail at that time. And that was seen as one of the few mercies there were yeah. of 2016. Now, that was for... Crucifying a man. Yeah, he, he basically um, uh, was intimidating uh, a businessman uh, from the traveling community, trying to get money off him. Um, he basically crucified him, as you said, uh, hung him up and nailed in his, his arms. So really, really savage crime. Of course, Jared Mackin is, is had previously been convicted of, of, of murder, a decision that was overturned. At that point, he was associated with different paramilitary groups in the north. But he seems to have, even they didn't seem to want anything to do with him. Mm. And he ended up in South, in, down here, uh, sort of as a, I suppose, a gun for hire. I mean, we call it the new INLA, but it's as much as anything, it's just a, a, a it, they weren't a paramilitary organization as such. They really were a uh, gangland muscle for hire. Yeah. And um, Mackin was offering his services around the place, down in Limerick to do, to to keen, the remnants of the Keen Colopy gang. And, uh, a violent, violent person. Now, when he got out of jail, which I think was around maybe 2017, 2018, he was then collated along with Caelan Smith, who is currently serving a lengthy sentence for a plot to kill James Mago Gately. Yeah, so Caelan Smith was a, a young guy, part of the Gucci gang. Again, like like Macken, um, he had developed this reputation for being somebody who was who was particularly violent, was willing to 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 go that step further, um, and he is believed to have been the trigger man in an unsuccessful bid to kill Mago Gately as he he shot him uh, mm. uh, as he sat in a car. Um, so Mac and we were hearing about particularly down in Limerick. Um, we had some images of him out drinking with with senior members of the Keen the Keen family. But all admissible, of course, I just like to say <laughs> when you say you have images of yeah. him, he really is because he's a sort of a, well, actually, Eamon Dillon, I think, describes him as a ginger beast. Yeah, he's a big guy and he has um, he has like quite striking red hair. Yeah, the bit of it he has left because he shaves his hair, his head and he has a quite a sort of a an unusual wrinkled almost skull. Um, but he's big, he's tattooed. He is scary looking. Yeah, unmissable. Um, so he seems to have been living in the at one point with, with Caelan Smith around the Pierce Street area. And he certainly was uh, sending waves of fear through, 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 through gangland. Of course, his associates, Johnny Kyo and Th Thomas Tossie Fox, who are serving uh, life sentences for the murder of Garrett Hutch, they were all associated with each other. Now those guys had grown up with the Hutches. I mean, they had known them from 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 the day they were born. They had known the Hutches, um, but they were and and Jonathan Cole in particular had been associated with the INLA at one point. But really, at this point, they were they were just being paid money, mm -hmm. and the Kinnahans at that point had had really. Uh, were really going for two targets, Mago and Patsy. I mean, they were the, the ultimate targets that they wanted and they were throwing money at it, really. And mm -hmm. these were the guys that they trusted to carry it out. Now, around 2019, there was photographs of Macken in Dubai and he was photographed with his partner on a yacht um, living it up. Uh, presumably he'd loads of sunscreen on because uh, with the ginger hair, I'm sure he would have suffered severe burns. But nonetheless, he was out there and the information is that he went out there to meet Daniel Kinahan. He was very thin on the ground at this point yep. with lieutenants because so many of them had been swept up in the investigation back home and he was kind of taken on anybody. He gave Mackin control 
over one of the drug routes into Ireland. And he also gave him the money to try and kill Jerry Hutch. Yeah. Um, he had flown out a number of people out to Dubai. Uh, at this stage, he was not coming back to Spain. He wasn't certainly wasn't coming back to Ireland. And I think they felt safer actually flying these guys out, even just for something as simple as a, co- a conversation. Yeah. Um, all of that stuff was not being See, done by phone. Those encrypted phones had already, there'd been a load of those hacks that happened at that stage. They were terribly uh, paranoid about the phones. So Yeah, they were bringing people over literally for, for meetings over there. They obviously felt safer and mm-hmm. in terms of surveillance, they didn't, and there probably wasn't much going on, uh, certainly by the, the, the local police forces. So he, he had flown them over. Um, and, it, it, you know, at this point, they really... Um, they really had a lot less people on the ground of their really trusted network. People people like Sean McGovern was was mm. in Dubai now full time, wasn't going back to Ireland either and a, and a host of other guys as well. Yeah, because the Imre Arrakis uh, hit, attempted hit on Mago Gately, which happened just months before Caelan Smith shot him in the garage forecourt in Dublin. But that foiled hit basically swept up some of the senior, the last of the senior command of, of Thomas Bomber Kavanagh's outfit and Daniel Kinahan's outfit. Um, yeah, you had guys like Patter Keating were picked up, uh, Douglas Glynn. Douglas Glynn was who Glynn. I was trying to think of, yeah. So there was a series of those guys. He was Kinahan's main man uh, at that time in, in Dublin, Douglas Glynn. So, um, I mean, the idea that this guy is has 100,000 in his back pocket yeah. And, you know, is on a promise of 900,000 if he gets the monk. Yeah. I mean, this is serious. And we have the monk is, you know, hanging around Dublin, but he is safe here. Well, he's he's probably safe. I mean, I think. I think he's safer here than he is anywhere else, because I don't honestly think you'd get the attention to detail in any other country, jurisdiction in Spain, anywhere else like that, isn't really as engaged with the threat to him, who his enemies are. Um, he's also got his community around him who will be around him and backing him. And he has, you know, that that sort of sense, I think, of community possibly has rebuilt a bit in the north inner city since a lot of those Kinahan hitmen were were rooted out and have been jailed. They've been exposed, those that took the money from the Kinahans. Look, I mean, I don't think you could pick out uh, 10 people that are, really trusted by the Ginnans left in Ireland. I just don't think so. I mm. mean, I don't doubt there's many, many people who know them and uh, they could probably hire some addicts and throw a bit of money at them. But like, by all accounts, what we're seeing in recent times is that they're having to bring people in and they're having to deal with non-national uh, gangland criminals, for example. They're, they're, e- e- what drugs they are getting in, they're, they're dealing with them. We had a case of a guy being uh, a Liverpool guy coming over here to do work for them. He w- ended up doing 11 years in recent times. So they don't have that network. And um, it's not, it's, look, as, as, as you can see, it's just not as simple to... to mm-hmm. But they have in the past proved that they can fly hitmen in as well as dealers. So can, but if there you is look that. At but I think that in Ireland, in Dublin, it's it's a case of for the monk, he knows what's around him and what should be around him. And the people, are, you know, that, that sort of, I suppose, are around him in the north inner city and out outwards to Clontarf where he lives, probably know who should be there and who shouldn't. Yeah, and of so course. he's a better chance of maybe... Yeah, he has. It. I mean, I think Spain, like probably he did have a, you know, where he was living in Lanzarote, he probably had some sort of network there. But there's no doubt Spain is, is there's a huge amount of expat criminals and, and the Spanish police traditionally don't seem to be on top of everything to say the least. But um, when you think about it in, in Lanzarote, right, yeah. you know, he avoided getting killed that New Year's Eve when he was out in the local pub. But the reason he got avoided was because he recognised yeah. the two guys from yeah. Dublin who were in the pub and who kind of, it didn't look right. They shouldn't have been there. Um, the way they were behaving was obviously a bit shifty. Yeah. But if somebody had come in from Estonia or from wherever else, he wouldn't have been as astute to that. No. And of course, there are these, um, like we saw, uh, you know, a number of months ago, there was a, a an Irish guy was shot as he was fishing in Spain. And it appears that somebody had paid. There was this gang of six mm. 
uh, hitmen basically from the UK who were contract killers for hire floating around Spain. Um, so obviously those that is a bigger risk over there than over here. So like, you know, the, the guards, of course, as well, are just monitoring, monitoring, monitoring and mm. are very much on top of all all, all the kind of networks. So, but yeah, it's, you know, the, the days of, um, I think, the, the having that network, because if you remember, Imre Arrakis landed. Yeah. Right? And he was the sole, he was going to do this all on his own. But there was about 10 people helped him one way or another. Yeah. You know, even with the basics of collecting from the airport, lots of the phones. And obviously, the you know, he, to he talked about it on the uh, on those encrypted messages that were recorded, the dog, which was the phone, yeah. the, sorry, the, the gun. Yeah. And he wanted a silencer and somebody has to get that for him and, yeah. you know, give him you can't fly into the country no. with a gun. You have to be given one here, exactly. I suppose. So, yeah, no, it's 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 interesting. And then, of course, you have the situation, the crazy situation that has developed that. Um, the Gardaí, while they're, you know, dismantling the Kinahan organization, investigating the Hutch organization, they've wound up because of where they live, by the nature of where they live, having to almost protect members of the Hutch crew that have stayed in Dublin. It's crazy. But I mean, as somebody pointed out to me with Patsy Hutch and, you know, there's a car, as we've spoken about, sitting at the end of his road 24-7 since the 5th of February 2016. There's also a school there. Yeah. A there primary is, school and and what do you do and who is going to pull the plug on that yeah. security th detail? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you were in control of, of the guards or whoever it yeah. is that, that pulls it, is it the Department of Justice or what? Um, no, I'd say it's, a, it's yeah, the guards or whatever. Guard assessment. Look. So would you do it? Me? And no, well, I, but, <laughs> but I'd probably... No, I wouldn't uh, because, you know, it's particularly where You're kind of goosed, really, aren't you? Because yeah, you, you leave it on, you're criticised, you take it off. Yeah, unless he is willing to leave there. And I mean, that's one of the big main thoroughfares of Dublin. Mm. There's a huge amount of people in and out of that area normally anyway. Like, it's not like it's a cul-de-sac in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Um, no, I, I'd keep it on. I mean, the, the state is a duty to protect the lives of people. But it's just the more the, the situation goes on, um, there's just more sort of bizarre aspects to the whole okay. thing, isn't there? I mean, even the GSOC uh, thing, not to get into that now because we're doing something else, but every single thing. It's strange. And it's just strange. I mean, we used to have. Uh, or is it just the nature of how small our country is? And I don't know. You know it's it's some, Maybe it's just the level of attention that is paid to this case. And these just sort of mm -hmm. bizarre incidents keep popping up. There was always, I mean, you, you remember it, Nicola, not giving away our ages, but the gross, unprecedented, what was it, Goo Boo? Yeah. You know, it was a description of when Malcolm McCarter was found in the Attorney General's house. Malcolm yeah. McCarter was a serial killer and he'd been gone on the run and he was found living in the most senior legal person uh, in the state's ho home. But there's an aspect of that now. To, there is. There's some of that where things are just kind of, just a bizarre. But I suppose in a way as well, the longer, I mean, we always talk about the kind of converging of the legitimate world and the yeah. criminal world. And the longer you are involved in organized crime or not, as yeah. the case may be with Jared Hutch, yeah. as he says. But I mean, he's he is still in the Hutch organization have been recognized as an organized crime group by the special criminal court in its judgment. The longer they are in existence, the more likely it is for everything to merge. I mean, we have a situation that there is a, a retired senior officer being investigated for giving information to them. Is that surprising? It's not really when you think about it. They're around that long. They are. And not to jump on the, uh, you know, the, the, the IRA thing and all, but I mean, presumably Jerry has been dealing with the IRA since the seventies, the eighties. Yeah. And presumably he dealt with some people who went on to become politicians. respectable politicians exactly. in Sinn Féin who may be the next government. That's not to get into the whole thing that they're, you know, so Jonathan Dowdle was just mounting off and there's no connection with the provost, I would imagine, of any meaningful sense. But it's just, yeah, that's the way it goes. I mean, it's, it, it there is, it is a small country. Um, and yeah, the, the ties though, I think it's the level of attention of mm. detail to the thing and it starts bringing all these things to light. And also maybe, I suppose, that the more we're in tune with it and who everybody yeah. is, then we're able to kind of piece together the pieces of the jigsaw, which is exactly what we were able to do 
eventually after listening to the um, meetings that went on in the north, you know, we only were privy to them during the trial that Jerry the Monk Hutch obviously was driven north by Jonathan Dowdall on a number of occasions to meet these dissidents. The point being that he was going to try and broker a peace deal with Daniel Kinahan and the dissidents were going to basically bring Kinahan to heel, I think is yeah. what we can say. Um, and as a result, they were going to get a present of the three yokes, which the Special Criminal Court conceded were the AK-47s used in the Regency. So these people we were who were described throughout the trial as we and fish and there was another few nicknames. There was a fluff and there was this, that and the other and not being uh, as au fait with our northern brethren within the criminal underworld. It did take us a while to work out who yeah. was who. Well, we finally did. So one of the three men named as Kevin Tyrone O'Neill, we're able to say, is a dissident by the name of Kevin Murphy. Yeah. Now, he was the guy that the Hutch and Dowdall were meeting. Um, he was sort of promising them further up the chain and there was a couple of, certainly with Dowdall, there was a couple of times further up the chain didn't show up. But nonetheless, when we have his identity, Kevin Murphy, we realise or we're able to realise that he is the member of the new IRA. Allegedly. like he, Allegedly. Yeah. Who was allegedly most um, compromised by, and this throws another aspect mm -hmm. into it, uh, a double agent by the name of Dennis McFadden, who was working for MI5 and who was embedded at that time in 2016 in the new IRA. So I think, again, it is a bit of a bizarre twist, isn't it? Not? <laughs> like, right. So like to describe uh, uh, Dennis McFadden. So obviously people maybe down here wouldn't be as up to date in it as our listeners in the north. But Dennis McFadden was an implanted double agent. Um, he seems to have been working for MI5 for a long, long time. He was originally from Scotland. He came over here. He got involved in uh, sort of uh, maybe legitimate organizations looking after Republican prisoners. He seems then to have gotten in with the uh, the new IRA. Um, he had plenty of money. He brought them on holidays, brought them over to Celtic trips, got more and more in uh, with them and eventually was being uh, hosting some of their meetings and every single thing he seems to have recorded for a long period of time. Um, so he was probably the most high end spy of recent yeah, there decades. Was, yeah, you know, since, since since maybe the, the Oma bombing. Exactly. Since the Oma bombing. Mm. Um, he also settled down, lived in a normal house and was married or had a partner and a child. And like, so he, he was living. I mean, what a weird job. Yeah. What a weird way to live. I mean, what sort of a an individual is able to do that, is able to literally go with a kind of a strange backstory. He was a Scot. Yeah. Um, you know, given a backstory, given a new identity and implanted into this organization and to be constantly secretly meeting. And yeah, I, mean, I mean, you're in danger every day of your life. You're in danger every day. I mean, it's kind of um, like it's yeah, it's look, it's 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 the thing of. of Movies really, isn't yes, it? Yes, like, it is. You know, I mean, so. Um, and, and also, sorry, just I know from our colleague Alison Morris in the North that this guy, M McFadden, was, was there for years with the new IRA and was, you know, feeding information into the intelligence services about who they were, what they were planning on doing, et cetera, et cetera, who they were in with, who they were out with. He, um, he also... When lockdown came, because a lot of their meetings used to be held in pubs, he seems to have either built a pub in his garden for yeah, them and yeah. invited them over and they all came into this sort of a yeah. outdoor uh, shebeen thing. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. They, you know what I mean? If they yeah. if they can't come to the bars, you come to us, we'll make you a, a bar. Uh, Murphy, this guy we're talking about, Kevin Tyrone O'Neill, who was referred to time and again over the course of the Regency trial, he was most friendly with McFadden. Now, while we don't know exactly how close they were back in 2016, we know in, in years after that, they holidayed three times together with their wives, all expenses paid. Um, and actually, the new, the alleged new IRA leader, Thomas Ash Mellon, who didn't like 
um, McFadden at all is has fallen out completely with Murphy because yeah. he never really kind of engaged with him and he, he believes that I think Murphy was thick or whatever that he fell yeah. for it. And they weren't, well, they weren't too smart. Um, no, I mean, I think the Thomas Ashmalin is based in Derry. They've kind of always been a slightly more, uh, you know, autonomous organisation to a degree. But again, like, so this guy, we know that he's worked for MI5 for a long, long time. Did he know about stuff about the Regency? Well, what advance? we do know is that, and I'm just going to come to this and and, and uh, read it out to you, because what we did hear during the Regency trial was Detective Superintendent William Johnson said he'd authorised a tracker on the Land Cruiser on February the 16th, 2016, yeah. after Detective Superintendent Eugene Lynch received secretive, secret sensitive intelligence that Dowdall was to travel to Northern Ireland. Yeah. So that was actually read into the courts and yeah. we can suggest that that yeah. secret intelligence was coming from the North and was likely coming from McFadden who was the spy within the ranks there. Exactly. It certainly could have absolutely would make sense. So it's another, um, like on whatever that secret intelligence is, no matter what court cases go on in the future, we're never going to know that. I mean, that that is the fact, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like, it's never going to be made public. Um, no matter what investigation goes on into the, the how the Regency trial went, you know, in political or in guarded circles, we're never going to know. But it's just another funny, funny thing. And then it was reported in another Sunday newspaper that that there was also another informer in the camp, whether we haven't heard that ourselves. So... Within the new IRA camp, well, within within uh, you know flat cap basically was yeah. was, was named. So, look, and then uh, others have speculated that Dowdall could have been an informer as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean I that is. That I know some of the paramilitary organisations in the north currently would be kind of suspecting that 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 he was, uh, you know. I was talking to an individual who said that from the beginning. So we would just go back to this for a second okay. to say that just to keep things simple, I suppose, that these are all Jonathan Dowdall's connections. He's bringing Hutch to meet yep. them. And I think after the Regency, they summons yep. Hutch to them. Yep. Um, the His point of contact, his first point of contact was the, um, the Garda killer, Pierce McCauley. Yeah. And he denied knowing him too well, but it turned out he'd visited him 14 times in prison and Macaulay had given Dowdall an introduction to a guy called Wee and we've been able to identify that Wee is Paul Bosco, Bosco McCready. He was a veteran Republican who was put in touch with Dowdall by Macaulay, right? Yeah. So he was regularly referred to and I think on the second time they went up to the north, um, Dowdall and Hutch were brought to a roadside in Straban um, yeah. where they got out of the car and they met three men who they later described as the three queen bees. And we've been able to establish through the judgment that one of the queen bees was him, the, the actual new IRA leader, Thomas Ash Mellon himself. Now, Dowdall described <laughs> him, one of his many faux pas on the tips, he described him as brain dead, which I'm sure he... <laughs> it's not a ringing endorsement coming from... <laughs> <laughs> so he was one of them on the roadside. The second one, we've, the third one we haven't uh, identified. Mm. Kevin Murphy, of course, was the, the second. Yeah. So they're significant characters that were there in the middle of it. Now, Ash Mellon, apparently, while he was described as brain dead by Dowdall, he didn't like Dowdall back. Yeah. He reckoned Dowdall was a drug dealer, that yeah. he was he was flashy, yeah. he was mouthy, yeah. and he was asking too many questions. Yeah. And this, this is what the suspicion that's coming from the dissident camps about Jonathan Dowdle. And you can understand why, because if you listen to the tapes, uh, which we both did in court, Jonathan Dowdle keeps asking these kind of leading questions about, yeah. you know, I read that in the papers. Did you do that, Jerry? Yeah. Or, you know, that happened there. What do you think of that? Who do you think did that, Jerry? Like, at least it could be just... The way he is. Just be, could be the way it is. But if you listen to it in a, with a certain conspiratorial mind, it sounds like Jonathan Dowdle is trying to get Jerry to make some admission on tape. And that's that's what's led to this belief that yeah. not that Jonathan Dowdle was already compromised and may have already been, you know. Now, if you if you were to take that and, and say that, yeah. OK, he was compromised at that yeah. stage, he knew there was a bug in his yeah. car and he was hoping to entrap yeah. Jerry. Yeah. 
Hutch. Why then is he, does he end up being charged with murder and exactly. his house being raided? So that doesn't really make... It doesn't really make sense, but you can see why that can... Exactly, it doesn't make sense. I mean, mm. and certainly why if you... If I mean, you, unless you believed that this massive pretense was put up by yeah. everybody within the... Yeah. The criminal, the crime and security division, in order to make it look yeah. as if he wasn't, or yeah. then you start and, getting. And, a bit but you see, the the reason that these things come out, of course, um, uh, particularly in the north of Ireland, from these paramilitary organisations, they're always on the hunt for touts and this dirty mm. war because they went through that for many, many years. I mean, how the the, the British secret service or secret services operated in the north. I mean, they did fight a bloody war and get up to all types of things and. We've seen that inquiry after inquiry where they did know murders were going to go ahead. They chose not to intervene in order to yeah. not to blow sources. So that's the conspiratorial. Look, I don't think. And I of don't course, think they, they worked with these paramilitary organizations because, of course, in the middle of it. And yeah. we were we had named Willie Gallagher as the man called yeah. Fluff. We were in court when um, the it was it was described how he had offered to kill the burn parents. Yeah. And um, this was during a conversation between Dowdall and Hutch in the car. Um, and we were able to identify him as Willie Gallagher. Willie Gallagher has given us a statement saying he absolutely has never met either of them and he never um, offered to kill the Byrne parents, which actually makes more sense than the fact that he did, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and I like think... Why would he offer to kill those? I don't know. People? And I think, look, I think... Um, there is reason to believe what he's saying is true. But I of think course, in this case, there certainly is. And I have to say, like, you know, I do know that there is this sort of investigation going on within the paramilitaries up there as to was Gallagher named in order to have him killed. Yeah. So like in our world down here, we would think that's crazy, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, as I say, if you're living in the north and you've had the police colluding with terrorists, they people did. killed. They had all sorts of stuff going on. I mean, mm. there's absolutely no doubt. It. And you can see that with f the death of Freddie Scapatici, not to go into that, but an, an IRA guy. Uh, who was in charge of eternal discipline and it was riddled with informers and mm. incredibly bad practice and these things did go on. Um, so it's we're, we're naive really down here in, we our, are naive, little, in our little it, uh, blue, yeah, you know, possibly. forest of bluebells. Yeah. Because, you know, like there's plenty of stories up in the north that you, you hear and you kind of have a tendency to go throw your eyes up to yeah. them. But actually... There is a murky, a really, really, really murky, dirty war went on. Yeah. Um, on all sides, of course, but a really, really incredible stuff went on. And then when you start opening your mind to it, you get really paranoid yourself <laughs> yeah, and you yeah. kind of start second guessing everything yeah, and yeah. nothing seems as it is. No. Nothing seems clear. And of course, some of the, the facts that the normal uh, in normal procedures, in if you go sit through a murder trial, every evident, piece of evidence can be tested and heard. But when there's the operation of of aspects of the guard guarded they'll never be uh, mm -hmm. uh they can always just claim privilege say that's that would reveal sources and we don't hear what goes on in the background no did you notice that during the trial Dowdall refused to name thomas ash Mellon? yeah he did repeatedly he, refused and he made a point of exonerating Sinn Féin as yeah well, which I think was probably so was it just damage damage limitation on his behalf because really when when and he then he went, also like bizarrely tried to sort of suck up to the Kinnons as well and yeah. sort of say they were the victims was he, yeah as in that that the Hutches had started it but he didn't suck up to Daniel Kinnahan because he told us that Daniel Kinnahan had uh, reneged on his word and shot Patrick Hutch through the bone as opposed to the flesh wound he was due to give him but he did sort of make a point that it was all started by Patsy's sons. As yeah, he, he did, I suppose. And he did also make a point of apologising for some of the stuff to the Byrne family, you know. Um, but so he, what do you think he was just trying to, you know... I think he's trying to be a good guy. Be a for good guy for uh, as many as people yeah, as possible. Yeah, yeah. He was trying to limit his enemies. A PR campaign. Yeah, we shouldn't really be laughing no. at it, but he is um, possibly due out quicker than expected. I mean, listen... I know we, we, we have a story and we, we will be following up on Dowdall's release, particularly his father, Patrick Dowdall. But I can tell you we're not going to get information on that because no. they're witness protection now. Yeah. And it would actually nearly be, it would also be illegal for us, by the way, to yeah. try and find out where they were or anything like that, um, which is understandable. But they, I imagine, are going to be released from the prison secretly. There's going to be no proper official dates no, given. No, I don't. I don't. Look, I'd imagine that will be the last we'll ever hear of them. Yeah. Um, and in the judgment, you know, the judges 
Justice Tara Burns did say if there's somebody who can make a good go of a new life, it is Jonathan Dowdle. Yeah. That he is a businessman and he has the capacity, he has a trade. I don't think we'll he I don't think he will be like some of the other people who went into witness protection and became fishes out of water. Mm. Couldn't really cope away from you know, Dublin and from their home lives. I don't think Jonathan Dowdle will be seeing them again, but it's... And he has <coughs> to keep his mouth shut. He'll have to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, I would find, uh, yeah, well, look, will be his most, will be his most would, problematic. Would you, you think and he's up? also in bad health, Jonathan Dowdle. I mean, that isn't a honker about that he was talking about when he went into the witness. I mean, it all sort of slightly got, yeah. you know, covered up with the rest of the thing that was going on, but he was talking about having serious uh, spinal issues yeah, yeah, and he was on medication if you remember when he came in initially to the courtroom he actually asked the judge sort of for help that yeah. he wasn't getting his medication and yeah. um, in the prison and that he had sp get spasms in his legs and while I maybe joked a bit about him constantly having to go to the bathroom maybe he did you know what I mean yeah. he's definitely in bad health for a young man um, which is going to be something that will be difficult maybe for him to, to do a physical yeah. job like um, an like electrician. Like yeah. Um, but nonetheless, we will probably never hear from him again. Or no. do they have to hold him in case? Will they ever? They can't ever put him into the witness box again. Well, Should I we? don't think so. I mean, I think that the, the that judgment will hang over him. Mm. Um, so if he went back to the witness box whatever about what he says, factually or not factually, as soon as he's been cross-examined, that's the opening point. I mean, these are findings of fact in the judgment that he lied repeatedly, that he was unreliable, that he was self-serving. And, you know, the state, I don't think, would just could justify bringing him back to, 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 to give that type of evidence. And whoever would go on trial on his evidence would be rubbing their hands with Lee. Um, it is it, where that the state are going to have to find another route, I think, if they pursue other prosecutions mm. than Jonathan Dowdle. And finally, I suppose, do we think there's a fallout within the paramilitary organizations by the evidence that came out during the trial? I mean, we do know certainly that there's an investigation going on behind the scenes as regards who may have leaked uh, or why. Willie mm. Gallagher's name back in 2016, mm. who might have said that he was, you know, looking to take out the burns. I mean, there's probably other stuff there that uh, we're just totally unaware of. That means a lot to people in certain par paramilitary organizations, and maybe not so much to us. But what will the fallout be? Are they just constantly all rowing and falling out and getting friendly and, you know? Yeah, I mean, look, I think you, you see to a degree how really what the, this trial shows possibly how toothless they are really mm. the remnants of those paramilitary organizations certainly capable of as we saw recently a, a PSNI officer shot capable of violence but even even in that shooting uh, rather than being carried out solely by the neo IRA they had to rely on criminals uh, non-aligned criminals for weapons and various other bits of information mm. so they are not what they were I mean, this is not the provisional IRA, like a, a relatively disciplined army. Mm -hmm. These people are really uh, big fishes in the small ponds of their own community where they do cause terror and harm. But I think if if you see them in comparison to a trans transnational gang, as the Kinnahans were, they're just not on the same level. Mm. They just took, it took something else for them to realise that. Yeah. Okay, now, Donald, thank you very much. Thanks, Nicola.